Um, I mentioned to the students that were here that um, when you go into Brightspace and you get the PowerPoints, the review documents, the lab for next week is Boyle's lab, Boyle's law. So don't miss that. Be prepared next week. But I got an extra document in there this time. I call it worked problems. Take the review document and I've taken every problem in the review document and, and written out by hand how I would solve each of those problems. You know, the way, the way to best use those uh, extra benefits is to go through the review document, treat it like an exam. Uh, take it, check it against the key that's in Brightspace and find out where you're wrong. Go look at the ones that you missed and see if you can figure them out yourself. Uh, research in the textbook, whatever it takes. If you're completely stumped, then go into the worked problems document and see how I did it. That's one way to do the problem. There's there are usually more than one solution to a problem, but you'll end up in the same place. But I thought with the worked problems document, um, since our schedules are so messy and it's hard for most of my students to connect with me uh, when I'm available, that this work problems document may fill in the gap between where you are and where I am. Okay, and I'm gonna do that. This is for exam three. I'm gonna do that for exam four also, the review document for exam four. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at chapter seven, gases, liquids, and solids. This covers a lot of territory, <clears throat> just those, those three phases. And you can see by, uh, by the various topics in there, and I, I may not be able to get very far. I mean, I may have to stop at 7.8, uh, which is fine. Um, I don't wanna short you on any of the uh, material, so let's say I want to make it at least to 7.8, Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. So let's move along here. But <clears throat> up to this point, we understand that there are different states of matter. Um, those uh, states of matter are interchangeable depending on the physical conditions. Um, you may have you, this particular substance will be a gas under certain conditions. It'll be a liquid under others and a solid under other conditions. Right? But the chemical nature, the identity of the substance has not changed. So it's not a chemical change. Uh, the physical properties that are associated with these uh, states of matter are volume. Right? You have a certain volume for your matter. Uh, does it have a shape? Right? Can it hold its own shape or does it need a vessel to hold it? Uh, density. What type of density are we talking about? Um, typically solids and liquids are high density and gases are very low density. Is it compressible? Right? When you squeeze on it, if you try to reduce its volume, does it give or does it resist? Uh, solids and liquids generally resist a change in volume. They're not compressible. Uh, gases are compressible. Thermal expansion. When you heat a substance, does it uh, expand? Well, every substance will expand, but how much? When you heat a gas, they tend to expand a lot. When you heat a liquid, they expand maybe a little bit, but not much. And solids, they expand even less when you heat them. All right, so, well, these are separate slides on those ideas. Compressibility is measuring a change in volume of a sample uh, as a result of pressure. Change the pressure, does the volume change? That's compressibility. Thermal expansion. Uh, in a physics course, you will 
there's a coefficient of value that's associated with every material. And it's, it shows the relationship between the change in temperature and how much the substance expands. Sometimes it's a linear coefficient. Does it get longer or does it change uh, in area or does it change in volume? There are different coefficients for those, but since this isn't a physics class, we're not gonna do that. All right, <clears throat> this is just a chart, comes straight out of your book, comparing the different states. Right? Um, solid state, liquid state, gaseous state across the top, and then the property associated with it. The top row is volume and shape. Solid states have a definite volume and a definite shape. You can take a solid, sit it on the table, and it will stay there. As long as the temperature, pressure, temperature doesn't change. Um, if you melt it, it becomes a liquid, then it has essentially the same volume as it did as a solid, but now its shape uh, it cannot be maintained. Uh, it either runs out over the, <laughs> the tabletop or you need a, a, a container, something to hold it but it can be an open container. Whereas if you change it into a gas, if you increase the temperature even further, change it into a gas, now it won't hold its shape and it won't hold its volume. So it has to be placed in a container with a fixed volume and the gas will expand to fill that volume. Uh, the other items I mentioned already. Okay, how do we explain these different physical properties? Well, we use the kinetic molecular theory of matter. That seems to be the best explanation for the different physical properties that we observe. Kinetic molecular theory. That theory got started with gases, but it was, it was so effective in explaining the behavior of gases and their physical properties that it was expanded into uh, liquid and solid territory. And with a few minor tweaks and changes, uh, it works just as well for all those three forms of matter. First of all, um, Matter is composed of tiny particles. Could be atoms, could be molecules, could be ions. But it's composed of lots of tiny particles. These particles have a definite shape, a definite size that does not change. Second, these particles are in constant random motion. And that motion is constant. And the only time the motion stops is if the substance reaches absolute zero, which means Every substance has these tiny particles and they're always moving. They never stop. Now, you can theoretically stop individual particles and it has been done in the laboratory, but for, our, for general purposes, um, matter is, is always moving. The mo they're either moving linearly or the particles may be vibrating. If they have a, a linear motion, and that's very typical for gases. Then we can calculate on an individual basis what's the kinetic energy of each of those particles. Right? And we use that formula. Um, kinetic energy equals one half in the squared. So you need to know how fast is the particle moving, what is its mass, and you can calculate. And, and these have to be in. SI units, meters per second, and then square it, and kilograms. 
And if those units are used, then this value will be the joule, that much energy. <clears throat> um, okay. Third, these particles do interact with one another. They, they bang into each other. Uh, let's see. The particles do interact. But on an ideal level, they don't attract each other and they don't repel one another. They just act like billiard balls. They just bounce off each other. Right? And their collisions are all elastic, we say. We say elastic because there's no loss of kinetic energy during the impact. In other words, the energy they come in with is the energy they leave with. Now, a small one coming into a large one may leave with less kinetic energy itself, but the other one will pick it up. It's conserved. Kinetic energy is conserved in a collision. Um, now, that's the ideal situation. We know and we can measure the interaction between particles. Sometimes they attract one another and sometimes they repel one another. And uh, if there's any type of interaction there, except for the billiard ball model, then we have the opportunity to measure some potential energy that is stored energy that this matter possesses as a consequence of, um, of various factors. Could be positional potential energy. Where is it? in relation to the other particles, or in relation to large masses for that matter, right? I have a certain amount of potential energy at this level above the surface of the earth. If I want to get it all back, I'll have to do is jump out the window. Electrostatic attractions are, are very important for um, atomic molecular interactions. Right. We mentioned um, in a previous chapter the um, polarity of molecules. So if you have a polar molecule, one side's going to be slightly negative and the other side's going to be slightly positive. And if they come together in the proper orientation to other molecules, then negatives can attract positives or positives can repel positives, negatives can repel negatives. So you see there are uh, three possibilities there. Well, actually two. Either they attract or they repel. This is the primary origin. Yeah? Electrostatic interactions, the primary origin of potential energy uh, between particles. Now, where we're heading with this is an understanding of potential energy versus kinetic energy. And try to get a, a handle on that because it will help us understand why uh, a substance is in the state it is, solid, liquid, or gas. Okay, so the kinetic energy, like I said before, is due to velocity. Anything that's moving has kinetic energy. So when we increase the temperature of a substance, the kinetic energy increases. In fact, temperature is a measure. Temperature measures the average kinetic energy of all the molecules, all the atoms, all the ions in a substance. It is a way of quantifying the kinetic energy. They're not directly interchangeable at least not easily. Uh, but the temperature does tell us that as it increases, the average kinetic energy of the particles in the substance increases as well. Um, I mentioned this before. During the collisions, uh, energy can be transferred from one particle to another and all the energy is conserved. 
Now, if we're in an ideal situation like billiard balls, then the kinetic energy is conserved. If we're in the real world, then all the energy is conserved, but some of it might be stored as potential energy. So you don't lose any energy, you don't create any energy, um, but uh, it may take different forms. Okay, now we're gonna try to explain the difference between solids, liquids, and gases in terms of the kinetic versus potential energy of the substance. <clears throat> All right. Um, think of the kinetic energy that is in a substance as a disruptive force because when two particles are approaching one another, if they're moving faster, then they're less likely to attract uh, or any forces that of attraction that there may exist between the two particles is minimized because um, they strike and they move away. There's so much extra energy, uh, kinetic energy, that it overcomes any attraction that they may feel. That's a disruptive force. So the higher the kinetic energy or the higher the temperature, the more disruptive forces are at play. Whereas potential energy, we think of it as a cohesive force, the electrostatic attraction between molecules and atoms is uh, a way of storing energy and drawing particles together. So when we do that, those cohesive forces are always in opposition to the disruptive forces, kinetic versus potential, is disruptive versus cohesive. Okay. So if there's more kinetic energy than there is potential energy, then the disruptive forces are um, dominant. If there's more potential energy versus kinetic energy, then the cohesive forces are more dominant. And if they're about equal, then we have another situation. And we're going to put a name to it in a second. Solids. What is the balance between disruptive and cohesive forces for solids? Solids tend to be dominant cohesive forces. Right? Holds things close together, holds it in their shape. So we have solids that are dominant on, on this side. Can I help you? Oh, you're changing a filter. Okay. <clears throat> I'm lecturing to myself today. <laughs> well, I figured you had a Zoom class or something. Yeah, except, yeah, I've got a few on Zoom. <laughs> I had a couple here earlier uh, in C, but uh, they had to depart. Okay, so uh, solids tend to have dominant cohesive forces and minimize the disruptive forces. Um, that allows the particles to draw together, fix the shape, fix the volume. And they, they tend to be, uh, the kinetic energy that they do have is more vibrational. They're moving, but they're just not moving linearly. Um, and this accounts for not just the volume and the shape, but the high density. Because if you have strong cohesive forces, you're drawing particles together, and that is uh, the same mass that would occupy this volume, if it's drawn together, has a smaller volume, which increases the density. Remember, density is mass per unit volume. So if we decrease the volume, we increase the density. Also, since these cohesive forces have already drawn stuff close together, 
there's not a whole lot of room left for compressibility. You, you can't compress a solid. Um, pressing on it has little or no effect on a solid. <coughs> Uh, thermal expansion is reduced also. Now you can heat it up and the molecules will vibrate even more, but until they reach the liquid state, then they're not moving anywhere. And in order to get thermal expansion, they have to move further away from each other. Now they will slightly. Right? Um, I can remember as a kid, um, railroad tracks. Railroad tracks, you'd go walk down the railroad tracks and every once in a while you'd find uh, a bracket holding two rails together. And then you'd walk another uh, 15 or 20 feet, and there'd be another one. So I always wondered why that was. Well, they put space between them because steel in those days had a much higher thermal expansion coefficient than it does today. So you have to leave room for those things when in the summer when they heat up, right, they don't uh, bang up against each other and start to warp. Nowadays, we have solids, steels, that have very, very, very low coefficients of thermal expansion. So you can have a, a rail that's uh, a mile long and uh, with no joints in it, which makes for a lot smoother ride. But it all has to do with the internal structure of the solid, right? How does it react to heat? Liquids. Liquids tend to be in the middle. Liquids tends to tend to balance the potential energy or the cohesive forces and the disruptive forces. Right? There's more motion and the liquid uh, molecules and atoms or molecules as the case may be are able to slide past one another. They're not held in a rigid structure. So that's why they don't hold their shape, but they will hold their volume. They're close enough to their neighbors that the cohesive forces keep them together. And the volume of a liquid is only slightly larger than the volume of a solid for most substances. There are some exceptions. But these particles are in constant motion and they're, they're in more motion than they would be in their solid state. So there's some disruptive forces in there that have to be balanced, and they're about equal. Right? So that means that liquids have to be held in a container. Um, the attractive forces are strong enough to keep the particles from getting too far from each other. And that's why they have a definite volume, right? They don't separate from one another um, to change their volume in that container. But they're not strong enough to prevent the particles from, um, from uh, staying in a regular order like a solid would be. They have generally high density because they're, they're just they're almost as close together particles as would be in the solid, right? So you have the same similar volume uh, with the same mass. They have almost the same density as their solids. Um, but there is space, there, there's some space between the particles. There's a little bit of room in there. Um, which means that their density will be slightly lower than the solid. And uh, there's room for compression. So when you try to compress a liquid, it will give a little bit. And we've measured that. Um, uh, deep in the ocean, we normally think of water as a liquid is incompressible. And for our purposes, yeah, it, it is at, at normal pressures or even up to uh, 50 or 60 atmospheres. But when you get down to the, the deeps, the depths of the ocean, the pressures there are so high that the density of water has been measured to be much higher than it is at the surface. 
they have a small thermal expansion. They're already given some extra energy with this disruptive forces. So they're already moving a little bit more than normal and you add more energy to them and they'll move further apart. So you start to overcome these cohesive forces with more disruptive forces and the molecules move further apart and that means they will expand. Not a lot, but uh, it's measurable, a measurable expansion. And of course, when we measure the expansion of a uh, uh, liquid, we're usually talking about a change in volume. Now, you know your student thermometers have that red liquid in them. Well, that red liquid responds to a change in temperature, right? So you have it in here, and it, you have a very thin capillary, and it might move up to that point. What we're measuring is a change in volume, but since that capillary is so small, then we see a large linear movement, right? What's the volume of a cylinder, right? The volume of a cylinder is the height times the area. If the area is very small, for the same volume change, the height has to be very large. That's why in a thermometer, that's a very thin tube. <coughs> so when we change the volume of the liquid, we see a massive change in that length. Gases. Gases, you might say, are unique. Disruptive forces dominate in a gas. I think I need to get a new marker. That's better. Okay. For gases, the disruptive forces dominate. They have much, much more kinetic energy per molecule. So we've, say we've heated it up from solid to liquid. Now we've got a gas, right? How do you get to a gas from a liquid? You boil it, right? <clears throat> it's just that simple. Once you get it all in the gas phase, now you have no definite shape and no definite volume. The disruptive forces are overwhelming. They dominate over the cohesive forces. And they make the gas molecules move very far apart. They act virtually independent from one another. <clears throat> right? And there's a, a artist rendition. So that's why you have to have a, a completely enclosed container for a gas. Right? So they have indefinite volume, indefinite shape. Uh, they have very, very low density. If you've taken the same mass here and moved it into a much, much larger volume, then the density goes way down by two, three, orders of magnitude, right? Remember what an order of magnitude is? An order of magnitude is power of 10. So if we uh, decrease the density from say one to 0 0.001, that's one, two, three, three orders of magnitude. Change. <clears throat> particles are very widely separated. That's why when you mix two gases together, you always get a homogeneous mixture, a solution, because there's, there's room for everybody. There's excess room compared to the size of the particles of a gas. The distance is almost infinite. And as a consequence, gases are very compressible. Um, just put a slight amount of pressure on a gas and the volume will decrease. Now, it will have an effect on the gas. And we're going to talk about that with the gas laws in just a few minutes.
<clears throat> very large compressibility. It only has a, very, a moderate thermal expansion, although it's a, a greater thermal expansion than for solids and liquids. <clears throat> um, but it's a measurable amount. Uh, increase the temperature and you get an increase in particle velocity, which means these particles are banging into each other with much greater force. And when you have greater force, you have greater speed, you have greater distance separating. So as you add energy, then they're going to they're going to go farther apart before they hit something else. <clears throat> and you get thermal expansion with gases in excess of solids and liquids. All right. So let's talk about gas laws. <clears throat> when um, <clears throat> in the history of modern chemistry and physics for that matter, modern sciences, the first materials that were seriously investigated, um, quantitatively speaking, were gases. Uh, it was more convenient to work with gases. For one thing, uh, as scientists discovered very early on, um, you could pick any gas you want and it would behave like any other gas with uh, physically speaking. Right? And that's what we're talking about. Gas laws address the physics of gases. But we're going to use information from that study of physics of gases to inform our chemistry of gases. All right, remember the difference between a law and a theory. Right? A law just says what happens. Whereas the theory says why. And generally speaking, laws come before theories. We need a lot of information before we can propose a why for anything happening. So we're going to look at laws first. And the gas laws come in in sequence based upon the available technology. All right. So first of all, four factors, four variables will completely define the physics of a gas. Pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of particles, moles. How many moles of the gas do you have? So you know these four, you can completely describe the physical behavior of a gas and any transitions that it goes through that are not chemical. Okay, we need a way to express pressure. And that came very early on, like in the uh, early six, uh, 17th century with the barometer. The barometer could measure air pressure. And it used a device invented by uh, Evangelista Torricelli. He was an Italian. And uh, let me see if that's coming up, if I, I don't need to draw uh, pictures. Uh, yeah, yeah. We got a picture coming up, so I won't, I won't draw one now. <clears throat> we need units of measure. <clears throat> By definition, pressure equals a force over a certain area, a force per area, which means that pressure is an intensive property. If you increase the force and you increase the area, by the same proportion, then the pressure won't change, right? It doesn't matter how much. Um, but force is an extensive property. Area is an extensive property. It does matter how much you have. All right, so what are the units of measure that we use? Well, in the SI system, force is the Newton, named after Isaac Newton. And area 
is a derived quantity from the linear standard meter, meter squared. So one Newton per square meter is equal to a new unit that we call the Pascal. And that's named after another scientist. Now, we typically don't use these in uh, beginning classes. We generally use the types of measurements that were used early on in the, uh, in the development. These, these units came later. The, the advantage of these types of units in the SI system is they're all interchangeable. You can either derive these units or you can use their equivalent values, the unit structure, in order to put them into an equation and cancel units and come out with the right answer in its proper units. So um, one unit of measure that we use is the atmosphere. And it's roughly equal to, well, it has been fixed as a standard, but one atmosphere um, is the pressure that you would experience on average at sea level, the atmospheric pressure. And we've also standardized that in terms of the barometer. And this is not gonna mean anything until I describe what the barometer is and how it works, but we're gonna put it in here anyway. 760 millimeters of mercury, which is also 760 Tor, named in honor of Torricelli. Um, in the uh, English system, the force would be uh, pounds per square inch, right? So when you put air in your tires, uh, bicycle tires, automobile tires, you're measuring it in PSI, pounds per square inch, right? And one atmosphere is equal to 14 point, that slide says 7.7, 7, but I say 0.69 pounds per square inch or PSI, okay? Now I'll explain the, the millimeters of mercury in a second. Uh, you know, that's not actually true. Which one of these actually contains units of force? Uh, none of them. Well, pounds per square inch, that, that it contains units of force. This is an old slide. I need to fix that. Because kilogram is a mass. It's not a force. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> when we confine a gas in a space, in a volume, um, we can measure the pressure on the inside of that container. So there's a gas in here, and we want to measure the pressure, so we put a gauge in it. Right, we can measure the pressure. Why can we measure the pressure? Right. In order for the gauge to measure a pressure, it has to feel a force in its mechanism. So how does it feel a force in its mechanism? Well, we go back to the kinetic molecular theory. Those molecules are moving. Each one has kinetic energy. So when it strikes the diaphragm inside that uh, gauge, it registers a force. If it were not for the fact that molecules bounce off the walls, right, bounce off the walls here, or bounce here, you would not be able to measure a pressure. Okay, so here's the barometer. And maybe I might have to draw a picture after all. Let's see. 
Let me clear some space out. Torricelli invented this thing. <clears throat> he knew that he needed a liquid. Solid wouldn't work because it, it doesn't move. And gases were difficult to use because you couldn't see them, most of them. And the ones you could see were toxic. So he needed a liquid. But he needed a liquid very high density. He did some calculations uh, and some comparisons of the different liquids. And he found that mercury was probably the best one to use because mercury has a very high density um, as compared to water. Right? It's about 13 and a half times as, much as dense as water. So um, he figured, or actually, I don't know, he may have experimented with it and found that when he took this container, and in those days, uh, glass blowers were very good at making tubes of uniform diameter. So all he needed was a tube. Right here. And he closed it off at one end. Right. So now he has liquid here. And his tube there. Okay. So, <clears throat> what he did was, he took this tube and turned it open end up so he could fill it. And he filled that tube all the way to the top with mercury. Let's see. Okay, just checking. <clears throat> he filled it to the top with mercury and then put his thumb over it and inverted it and submerged his hand in a pool of mercury. They didn't know about mercury toxicity back then. And then when he turned his thumb loose, he noticed that the level of mercury dropped. The level inside the tube dropped. Well, if there was mercury in there before, and now there's nothing there, what do you have? This was the creation of the first vacuum. Okay, a vacuum simply means that there's nothing there. So why did it only drop to here? It didn't drop all the way down. Torricelli reasoned that what was holding it up was a force. A force that was holding this up was being applied to the surface of the mercury. And he reasoned the reason it was doing that was because there's air. Air has mass, and the more mass you have, the more it pushes. So he took his barometer, and he threw it in the back of his ox cart and went up a mountain. And sure enough, when he went to a higher elevation, the mercury level dropped. And then when he went from where his present location down to the sea, the mercury level went up. So that was confirmation that what was holding that mercury up was air pressure. Now, he and other scientists um, took their barometers and set them on their desk and just watched them day after day after day. And they noticed that the level went up and down, and they correlated that movement with weather. And when the weather was, was turning bad, the level went down. And after the bad weather passed, the level went back up. So, and we do that today. We measure, we say, all right, low pressure means bad weather. High pressure means good weather. Okay, so this is where millimeters of mercury comes in. The distance between here and here, say right there, at, at one atmosphere at sea level should be 760 millimeters high. Okay. So that was set at one atmosphere pressure. All right, so let's talk about laws.
the first law we're interested in is the first law that was proposed by Robert Boyle. He was an Englishman. And he quantified the relationship between pressure and volume of a gas. Now, notice that when you let these two uh, variables change relative to one another, the other two must be constant. You need constant temperature and constant moles. You can't shove any more gases in there while you're working your experiment. You can't change the temperature while the experiment is going on. These are the only two that can vary. Okay, so Robert Boyle used a modification of uh, Torricelli's barometer. Uh, let's see. All right. There's no picture, so I'll draw you one. Boyle used a J tube. He took that long tube, sealed it at one end, and bent it into a J. Something like that. Okay. <clears throat> and then he used mercury. He poured mercury in here a little at a time. And it pulled out of the bottom, right here, mercury. Put a little more up here, put a little more. When it touches the inner curve, then all of this gas in here is sealed off. Constant moles. Can't put any more moles in, and you can't take any out. So that's constant. The temperature is going to be constant because this experiment takes just minutes to do. Right. The temperature is not going to change that much. If you want to be confirmed that the temperature is unchanged, just submerge this thing in ice water. You know, ice and water will be constant temperature at zero degrees Celsius for as long as there's solid ice in the liquid water. <clears throat> anyway, he kept adding mercury, and he noticed that the level of the mercury was not the same on both sides. Right? He might be here. Mercury would be up here, but it'd only go up there inside. So he reasoned that what was happening was this trapped gas was pushing on the mercury and holding it up higher on this side. Right? So there was a distance here. Right? Change in height there. Like that. And that plus atmospheric pressure, right? So he had a barometer and he took the barometer uh, and he added the pressure here against that amount of mercury. So, so many millimeters of mercury, say it only had 700 millimeters of mercury from the barometer. And then he had maybe uh, 25 millimeters here. So the total pressure on that gas will be 725 millimeters of mercury. And then uh, he needed to know the height of the, of the column of gas. And this was equivalent to volume because, remember, those tubes are very uniform diameter. So if you know the height, that's uh, directly proportional to the volume. Or you could measure the the area of the tube and multiply it times the height and get the volume. So that's, it works either way. Okay, so he just kept adding mercury and making measurements and he related the pressure to the volume. And what he found was that as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. And if you multiply those two values together, you get a constant value within that experiment, right? If you run the experiment again, then the values will change. <clears throat> but another way of expressing that is to say, okay, under, at this point, this instant, 
that pressure and that volume equals a constant value. So you add more mercury and you get a different pressure and a different volume, but they're still equal to the same constant. Okay? So what's that mathematical law? Um, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So if these are both equal to K, then they must be equal to each other. That's why that slide says P1V1 equals P2V2. And this is known as an inverse proportion. Anytime you have a, um, two variables as products, if the product of your two variables is equal to a constant, then you know you have an inverse relationship, an inverse proportion. Because look, if that's going to be constant, this one goes up, that one has to go down. That's the only way you can maintain that constant. So that's product of variables equals a constant. That's an inverse proportion. So this is what it would look like, uh, practical sense. Uh, 100 millimeters of mercury pressure gives you eight liters of gas. If you double the pressure, you get half the volume. And if you double the pressure again, you get half the volume again. Okay. All right. So let me see how we're only on section 7-4. <clears throat> um, let's see. Did I work this one out in? Yeah. Okay. If you got 24 liters, 12.4 liters at 23 degrees C and 0 0.956 atmospheres, what volume will it occupy at 1.2 atmospheres? This is what I call a before and after problem. You know the conditions before. You know some of the conditions after. And as long as only one variable is left unsolved, you can solve for that variable with the correct formula. So in this case, when you have a word problem like that, remember, word problems are specifically designed to confuse. So that if you don't know what you're doing, you'll never get the answer. So I pull information out of that problem and put it on the board. What do we have? Volume. The first volume is 12.4 liters, right? Um, first pressure, 0 0.956 atmospheres. What's the second volume? We don't know. It's unknown, right? There's your unknown. What's the second pressure? We're increasing the pressure to 1.2 atmospheres. Okay, so there you have it. By doing it this way, you've pulled your information out. Now you can put it in the formula and you'll know it goes in the right place. <coughs> because if you put those numbers in the wrong place in the formula, you're going to get the wrong answer. So fill in that, those values right here. Here, 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 here. Solve for your unknown. And you get 9.88 liters. Does that make sense? Well, we increase the pressure and we decrease the volume from 12.4 to 9. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Second law. Um, Robert Boyle uh, worked in the middle of the 17th century shortly after the barometer was invented. Because they had the technology now to investigate volume and pressure. They always knew about volume, but pressure was difficult to, to manage until the barometer. You were able to measure atmospheric pressure and then any additional pressure that Robert Boyle put on his gas would add it to that. It wasn't until the middle of the 18th century that a reliable method of measuring temperature was invented. Um, there were several inventors. Um, 
Fahrenheit invented a scale and a device for measuring temperatures that were primarily associated with living systems. Uh, Celsius came along and said, yeah, I'm working in chemistry. I want a different scale. So he invented a different scale uh, to work in the uh, chemical sciences, in the physics side. And that's the one we typically use, Celsius. But the problem with Celsius is sometimes it goes negative, right? With the, with the Celsius scale, right? you can have zero degrees Celsius and you can have 100 degrees Celsius. And those fix the top and the bottom of the scale, <coughs> right? But you can have um, your gases can go to negative values, right? They can go to negative 20, right? What is that going to do to any equations that you develop? Well, it's liable to mess them up. So what we need is a value of temperature that never goes negative. It's always positive. And that's the Kelvin scale. Absolute value. Kelvin is degree C plus 273. Why? Because Kelvin starts down here at zero. Right? When it gets to here, it's 273. Right? It's always positive. That solves the problem. So anytime you're going to use temperature in these gas formulas, be sure and convert your temperature to Kelvin. Or if the question asks you what is the temperature of the final temperature in Celsius, you've got to use Kelvin to get the answer. Then you need to convert back to Celsius. So Celsius then would be K minus 273. Just rearrange the equation. All right. So Charles, uh, he was a Frenchman. And now that he had a thermometer to work with, that was a uh, standardized scale, and you could standardize them easily. The Celsius thermometer, all you needed was an ice water bath, distilled water and ice together was zero degrees. And boiling water, you could standardize the top end at 100 and be sure that your thermometer was properly calibrated. So what Charles discovered was that, um, uh, yeah, what Charles discovered was if you let volume and temperature move then you have to fix pressure and moles. So that's what he did. And one of the best ways to do that is have a cylinder with a piston in it, and it's under constant pressure. Um, you can put a weight on it that's going to be constant as long as you don't move it to the moon. And this piston is allowed to move up and down, and then you change the temperature surrounding that gas. Right? And as you change the temperature, you can measure the change in volume. Okay, so when he did that, he found that um, volume will decrease as the temperature decreases. They are directly proportional. And he found that the, the ratio there is V divided by T equals a constant. Okay, we can follow the same logic as we did with Boyle's law and say, under those conditions, you get that constant. Under these new conditions, you still get that constant. So these are both equal to the same constant, which means which means that's a very useful form of the Charles law to solve problems. Before conditions, after conditions, 
Or if you know the after conditions, you want to find out what the before conditions were. You just fill in all your unknowns. And if one of them is left out, you can solve for that one. And we use the same reasoning here. We say, all right, what is temperature one? What is temperature two? Volume one, volume two. Right? For word problems, extract the information, right? And if you have a temperature here, you have degree C plus 273, right? Anytime you have a temperature, convert it to Kelvin. So here, if we start off at 100 Kelvin, which would be, um, it would be a negative, right? Yeah be a negative uh, 173 Celsius <clears throat> uh, at two liters, and then you heat it to 200 Kelvin, you get four liters, and heat it to 400 Kelvin, you get eight liters. So they're directly proportional. This is a direct proportion. And anytime you get two variables in a quotient equal to a constant, that's always direct proportion. Because if that's a constant, then if this one goes up, that one has to go up. That's the only way you can maintain the constant. That means they're directly proportional. Okay, uh, here's a sample problem. Let's see. Let's erase this. And here, and extract our information. Suppose a balloon containing 1.3 liters of air at 24.7 degrees Celsius is placed in a beaker containing liquid nitrogen at minus 78.5 degrees C. Uh, that's not right. Liquid nitrogen is much, much colder than that. Liquid nitrogen is minus 195 degrees C. It must be a typo. That's closer to um, dry ice, solid carbon dioxide. If you put it, now, if you've got liquid nitrogen here and there's the vapor up here, if you put the gas, the balloon in the vapor, yes, it could be minus 78.5. So that's how I would uh, rationalize that discrepancy. Uh, what's the volume of the sample after, after the air? Volume of the sample, constant pressure. And the balloon is, confines a certain number of moles of gas, so that doesn't change. Right, so what's the first temperature? 24.7. What's the first volume? 1.3 liters. What's the final temperature? Minus 78.5 degrees C. And what's the final volume? That's our unknown. So first we need to change temperatures. Right? Uh, 24.7 plus 273 is 297.7. Okay. And this one is... 78.5 minus, and then 273. So this one is 194.5. Okay. Now your textbook, your textbook may say the conversion factor is 273.15. Some say 15, 14, 16. But we're only going to use 273. We just rounded off to three, three significant figures. Okay, so now you know the unknown. Put your values, these values for temperature, this value for volume, and solve for your unknown. All right, and that's what, uh, yeah, there it is. So if you do that, you end up with uh, less than a liter. So we've cooled it down, and the volume has decreased. That's reasonable. Now, there's one law that's, that this slide set left out. 
and I'm going to give it to you anyway. It's called Avogadro's Law. Okay, so Avogadro now is going to let different ones vary. He's going to hold this one constant, pressure, and temperature constant. And these two, volume and moles, will vary. Now, I'm going to go into a lot of details because we don't have a lot of time. But simply saying, the volume and the number of moles are a direct proportion. As the number of moles, if you can put them, double the moles into your container, you will get double the volume at the same pressure and the same temperature. <coughs> and this works for Avogadro's law also. Avogadro was an Italian scientist. He had a student. His name was Cannizzaro. Cannizzaro actually, well, actually Cannizzaro and others, took Avogadro's uh, work and ran with it. Uh, and Avogadro himself um, expressed himself in, in different terms than this, but this is the condensed version. Now that we have those relationships, we can combine them. Because what if you've got a problem where several of these are varying? What are you going to do? Right? You can't use one of the, the aforenamed laws because they're only good if you've got only two variables. But let's look at what happens if you combine them mathematically. Right, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, correct? Yep. But we also know that Charles says that volume and temperature vary like this. Oops, my mistake. Temperature and temperature. That. Oops. That's the one that's given here. But the combined gas law that I, that I teach also includes moles, like that. That is the combined gas law. Now, notice that if you hold moles constant and you hold temperature constant, right, then those terms are equal, 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 equal. They cancel out, and you're left with Boyle's law. But if you hold pressure constant, and moles constant, they cancel out, and you're left with Charles' law. Right? So the combined gas law can work. All you need is, in any uh, algebraic expression like this, is one unknown. If you know the before conditions and the after conditions, with only one of them missing, one of these values is missing, it's, it's unknown, then you can solve for it. And you can rearrange it, right? Rearrange it any way you want. Okay, here's an example. At what temperature does 121 milliliters of carbon dioxide at 27 degrees and 1.05 atmospheres occupy a volume of 293 milliliters at a pressure of 1.4 atmospheres? <coughs> Notice also that these equations are set up uh, as ratios. So if pressure is in atmospheres here, it's got to be atmospheres there. If it's millimeters of mercury there, millimeters here. If it's tor there, it's tor here. If it's pounds per square inch there, it's pounds per square inch here. Uh, if the volume is liters here, liters there. Or milliliters there, milliliters there. Moles and moles, that's basically all you get. But temperature must be in an absolute scale. Right? For our purposes, we're using Kelvin. There are other absolute scales, but we're not going to introduce those. Uh, primarily, engineers use those. That's why they mess up so often.
because they don't know which one they're using. Uh, okay, so let's extract the information we have, right? P, V, and T. P, V, and T. P, V, and T. This is one, 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 two, 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 two. All right. Pressure. What's the starting pressure? A hundred and let's see. 1.05 atmospheres. Okay. Uh, 121 milliliters. Notice also, doesn't matter what the gas is. They, they tell us it's carbon dioxide, but who cares, right? A gas is a gas. For these gas laws, it doesn't matter what the gas is. Uh, let's see, what else are we giving? 27 degrees, right? Plus 273. And our final pressure is 1.40 atmospheres, okay? Uh, 293 milliliters. And the question is, at what temperature? Okay. Notice also that there's no mention of moles. We have to assume that the moles did not change. Once the gas is confined, we don't add anything to it. We don't subtract anything from it. So this term drops out. Now we have everything but that value. <coughs> and we can eliminate the moles. Now you just substitute the values that you know and solve for this one. And the answer needs to be in degrees Celsius. So you're gonna come out with K here and subtract 273 from it. Okay. And I think that's what the animation shows us. So we solve for that temperature, we get, uh, 969K, subtract 273, and the temperature is 696 degrees Celsius. There are several um, problems in the review document that will give you practice doing these things. Okay, now, up to this point, I've introduced the gas laws in terms of before and after. You know the before conditions, you know some of the after conditions, and you can solve the problem that way. But there are sometimes you're in what's called a state situation. In other words, you only know the conditions right now, and you're asked to solve a problem. There is a way. And I'm going to show you in just a second. All right, let's go back to uh, pressure, volume, moles, temperature. If that's equal to, if P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2T2, then this also has to be equal to a constant, right, for those two to be equal. So we're working backwards now instead of going from uh, the gas law to a usable form, we're going backwards and saying, now this is equal to a constant. Notice if we know what that constant is and we know three of these values, then we can solve for the other one. We just need to find out what is that one. Well, as it turns out, we can figure that out. All we need to know is the values and the units of measure for each of these right here. So, if we know that pressure is one atmosphere and volume is 22.4 liters of gas, and that's one mole of gas at zero degrees Celsius, which is 273K, then that will tell us what the, this constant is. And it turns out that that constant is equal to 
0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole K. So there are your units. Atmospheres, liters, moles, and K are there in that constant. And we give this a special letter. We call that the ideal gas constant. <clears throat> Notice that what I've given you is standard temperature and pressure. Standard pressure, standard temperature for gases. The standard temperature for gases is zero degrees Celsius or 273K. Now for other reactions, the standard temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Don't ask me why. <laughs> Just accept it. Standard temperature and pressure for gases is standard temperature is zero degrees and pressure is one atmosphere. <clears throat> now they give the R as 0.0821. I like 206. Um, if you use uh, 0.0821 to solve the problem, your answer may be slightly different, but if it's a multiple choice test, you pick the best answer. Right? That's the that's the rule I always go by. So this is a state function, right? You know where you are right now. You've made these measurements. So when you look at a word problem, you ask yourself, do you have before and after conditions? Right? You look, do you have two temperatures? Do you have two volumes? Do you have two pressures? Whatever. Or are you just given one of each and you're only missing one? Then you know you need to use this equation which is typically written this way. PV equals NRT. All right. So here's a state problem. An automobile tire at 23 degrees Celsius with an internal volume of 25 liters is filled with air to a total pressure of 2.18 atmospheres determine the number of moles, right? So we have temperature, we have volume, we have pressure, we have the constant, now we need the moles. The key to using this is to be sure your units are correct. Your units are these, liters, atmospheres, moles, and K. So we have to change the temperature to K, liters are good, atmospheres are good, we know R, we can solve for N. And that's what it would look like. <clears throat> so we know that that tire contains 2.24 moles of gas. Probably 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. If you're filling it with air. Okay, what's the pressure in a 304 liter tank that contains 5.670 kilograms of helium at 25 degrees? All right. So let me do this. <clears throat> and what do we know? Uh, we don't know the pressure. Pressure is unknown. How about volume? Volume is 304.0 liters. Okay. How about uh, temperature? 25 plus 273. And uh, moles. Right. Do we know the moles? No. Can we find the moles? Yes. We have a mass of helium. 5.670 kilograms. 5.670 kilograms of helium. Right? We can change that to moles using helium's molar mass. But notice here, these are kilograms. How many grams is that? Well, a kilo is equal to a thousand times, right? So just change the kilo into a thousand. 5.670 times 1,000 grams. Now we can convert it to moles. All right, so where's my chart? Helium is 
Yeah, I'll round it off two places, it's 4.0. Right? That gives us moles. And that value here goes right there. I think I've got an animation for that. Yeah, it puts everything in one in one place. <clears throat> so here's the here's the moles. Right? <clears throat> it shows you the moles right here. There's the pressure, which we don't know. There's the volume. There's your constant. There's your temperature. And we calculate that the pressure will now be, will be at this particular time under these conditions, 114 atmospheres. All right. Seven, seven, seven point eight. Okay, here's the last law. John Dalton, remember John Dalton, the atomic theory? That wasn't the only thing he did. <laughs> this is another line of investigation where John Dalton <coughs> proposed. A law of partial pressures. All right, consider this gas is not just a pure gas. Only helium, only oxygen, only nitrogen, whatever the case may be. Say it's a mixture, and you measure the pressure. You have a total pressure. Where did that pressure come from? The pressure came from uh, molecules bouncing off the walls of the container and striking your gauge. But which ones strike the gauge? Well, sometimes it was nitrogen and sometimes it was helium. Sometimes it was oxygen. Sometimes it was carbon dioxide, right? Could have been any one. You don't know. What Dalton said was that measured pressure is, a, is an arithmetic summation of the pressures of each one of the gases if they were in separate containers. So you could measure the pressure of oxygen in one container, nitrogen in another, carbon dioxide in another, helium in another, different pressures. When you put them together, right, if you put all those gases together, say they're all in, the, in one liters each. So you have one liter of each of the gases. Helium, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, right, one liter. If you put all those gases together in one liter, then the pressure is going to be the summation of each of the pressures of these gases in there. That's what Dalton said. So he said, the total pressure is equal to the pressure of each partial pressure. And it can go on and on and on. <clears throat> that is very useful. This is just an artist's description. One gas is at one atmosphere, the other is at three, and the other is at two. Put them in the same volume, all of them in the same volume, then you get a pressure of six. So this problem says a gas mixture consisting of oxygen, helium, and nitrogen has a total pressure of 780 millimeters of mercury. All right. So let's see here. We've got three gases, right? Uh, oxygen, helium, and nitrogen. Oxygen, helium, nitrogen. Okay, and the total pressure is 780 millimeters. Of mercury. Okay. What's the partial pressure of oxygen if the partial pressure of helium and nitrogen are uh, 86 and 124? 
millimeters of mercury, right? Now we're reduced to an algebraic expression with one unknown. Add these together, subtract it from that, and you got oxygen. 570 millimeters of oxygen. Millimeters of mercury for oxygen pressure. Okay. Let's take it one step further. Yeah, we got time. <clears throat> I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we got time. <clears throat> so, we got these two gases. And they're contained like that, like that, with a valve in the middle. That. This gas is at two atmospheres. And the container is nine liters. And this gas is at three atmospheres. And this container is three liters. Okay? The question is, when you open that valve, what will be the final pressure? Well, let's, let's look at it uh, before I actually solve the problem. Let's look at it this way. Where would you expect the pressure to be? Will it be greater than two atmospheres? Would it be less than three atmospheres? This is the higher pressure. Gas is going to be forced that direction. And the, the resulting pressure is somewhere between two and three, right? It won't be greater than two. It won't be less than three. Uh, won't be uh, greater than three. It won't be less than two. <coughs> okay, so now to solve the problem. Well, when you mix these two gases together, the total pressure, let's say this is bulb one, this is bulb two. So the, the, <coughs> the combined pressure is going to be equal to the partial pressure of one plus the partial pressure of two. Now that's not equal to this and that because the volumes are different. Remember earlier we had the same volumes. If they were exactly the same volumes, we could just add them together. <clears throat> but in this case, what we have to do is find out what would be the partial pressure of this gas spread into this new volume. And then go and say, what would be the partial pressure of this gas spread into the new volume? So what do we have to do? We have to do a thought problem. Let this be a vacuum. Open the valve and ask what is the final pressure. Then let this be a vacuum and open the valve and what would be the pressure due to that gas. Then add them together. So what laws do we have besides Dalton's partial pressure that would give us that answer? A before and after. Boyle's law, pressure, volume, pressure, volume, right? So if we let that would be a vacuum, then the, the beginning pressure here is two atmospheres, and the beginning volume is nine liters. I left out the decimals because the space. Now the new pressure, um, all right. I'm getting my variables mixed up now. <clears throat> right? So this is the one we're solving for. What's the new volume? It's 9 plus 3, 12 liters. Okay? So we can say 2 times 9 is equal to P2 times 12. So we need 18 divided by 12, right? Well, go over there, make it, put it in the denominator. That's one and a half. So this is 1.5 atmospheres. That's if we let that gas expand into a vacuum. 
Okay, let's do the same thing on this side. V1, V1, P2, V2. This is still going to be our unknown. The new volume is the same, 12 liters. The initial pressure is three atmospheres. And the initial volume is three liters. Okay, so now we can do um, three times three divided by 12 equals the new pressure. So nine divided by 12. is 0 0.75, 0 0.75 uh, atmospheres. So this is the pressure due to that gas into a vacuum. But they're not really in a vacuum, now they're mixed. So we have this pressure plus this pressure, 1.5 plus 0.75 is 2.25 atmospheres. And it is between 2 and 3. Oh, I actually worked it out, didn't I? Okay, well, there it is. One and a half. And then the second gas is 0.75, and the total is 2.25. That's where we use Boyle's Law and Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures to solve a problem. Okay. So, I guess it would be wise to pause here, and we'll pick it up. Next week with section 7.9. This is 7.1 to 7.8. <clears throat> Any questions, comments, concerns? Otherwise, uh, hopefully I'll see you guys next week.